Thanks for your singing. Well, we're going to continue on with our series. Here it is, uh, with on as you can follow, see in your with your message notes there, with our series in Joseph. So, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Genesis. You know, I uh, here it's Thanksgiving uh, week, and and uh, with our service coming up, and reminds me of this. Uh, what are turkeys thankful for? I thought for vegetarians. So, or what do you call a uh, what do you call a running turkey? Uh, fast food. So, <laughs> all right, we could go on, but we won't with those. But Thanksgiving, what a great time of uh, year this is. Uh, we love this time of year and the uh, the. The ability to, and again, the encouragement to give thanks and be grateful, and then as it leads into Christmas, as we celebrate the birth of Christ, and so it's a wonderful time of the year. Well, I've entitled this message, When We're Forced to See It's God's World, Not Ours. Uh, it's from uh, Genesis 42, as we continue on, and we'll have a, I'm not sure, just on a couple more yet with Joseph, um, uh, but we will... Um, Again, yeah, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll be reading those verses in just a few moments here. Well, let's pray. Lord, again, thank you so much for today. Thanks for your loving kindness and mercy. I pray that you would speak to us, teach us, open our hearts. Give us hearts that are open and receptive to your word. We pray this again in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You know, you could, uh, actually, you could say there is such a thing as kind of a true sinner's prayer and a bargainer's prayer, if you want to call it that. You know, that... The sinner's prayer is found in Luke 8, where it says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But the bargainer's prayer is usually more something like this. Uh, God, I'm in real trouble. Uh, you know, help me get out of this, and I'll, you know, I'll never do it again. You know, honest. Uh, of course, the prayer we like is that first one. But the, probably if we're maybe honest with ourselves, the one that gets used maybe a little more frequently is that second one, where we might say, you know, Lord, I'm, you know, my kids in trouble again, or uh, the illness is still there, or my co-workers acting up again. Uh, fix it, and then I'll do something religious that I think will please you. You know, again, it's, uh, it's like Martin Luther. When he was uh, on his way to becoming a lawyer, he was riding his horse, big lightning storm comes up, and he falls from his horse, and he says, you know, he said, spare my life, and I'll become a monk. His life was spared, and he became a monk. Uh, kind of making bargains like that. Uh, it's interesting, though, when I was, I was thinking of this. Uh, you know someone who didn't make a bargain with God, and you would think he would have, would have been Jonah? You know, remember, God told him to go preach in Nineveh, which would have been kind of like telling a, a Jewish guy to go speak in Berlin in the middle of World War II. You know, they were enemies. And he said, you know, no way. And he headed the opposite direction, got on a ship heading towards Spain, and... Uh, God causes a big storm to come up, and Jonah realizes, tells the sailors, okay, you know, it's, throw me overboard, and I'm the cause, and the storm will quit. And so they do, and the storm does quit. But it's surprising Jonah didn't say, Lord, you know, spare my life, and I'll go to Nineveh. Never did that, never said that anyway. Just, I mean, he'd rather die than go to Nineveh. But the Lord had other plans for him. But anyway, it's common when people find themselves in a jam to cry out to God, you know, and everything else they've tried just doesn't work. And uh, usually people often will try to cut a deal with God. You know, help me, and then I'll do this. But it's always them setting the terms. You know, I, that way you still kind of stay in control of things. But then when the crisis passes and things kind of, life kind of becomes manageable again, uh, you know, too often people just go back and live the way they always lived, and they forget about the bargain they made with God which is a serious thing. Remember Ecclesiastes 5, I think it says, if you, if you make a vow to the Lord, make sure you pay it. Um, it's better, he says, not to make a vow than to not pay it. Anyway, Joseph's brothers were uh, in kind of a situation like that. Remember, we left them. They were in Egypt. Now they were in an Egyptian prison. Didn't know how long they'd be in there. You know, in a strange land. They were accused of being spies. And... Uh, the thing is, that what we want to look at today is once they got out, once they were free, did they learn their lesson and did they change their ways? 
Well, our passage will show that to us. Let's read that. Uh, Genesis 42, beginning at verse 29. And then down a little ways here. Let's see. Well, I may skip through parts of it as we go along, but we'll get the idea here. When they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. So they'd been released from prison. They went back home, and they went back to Jacob. And the man, the man, the Lord of the land, they said, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to them, we are honest men. We've never been spies. We're 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, by this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go your way. But bring your youngest brother to me. Then I shall know that you are not spies, but honest men, and I'll deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land. And as they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. This is as they were heading home. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And we talked about that some last week. It's actually a token of God's grace, but their hearts really been such guilt. We talked about, you know, guilt a bunch of their last week. And they had such a guilty conscience for so long and uh, that they had basically stymied their conscience, but they couldn't even t accept these tokens of God's grace in the right way. They misinterpreted everything God was doing here to them, uh, some of it anyway. And it says, uh, You have bereaved me of my children, Jacob said. Joseph is no more. Simeon's no more. Now you would take Benjamin? All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons. You know, I'll, I'll go down and I'll get, you know, the, I'll get Simeon back and, and I'll bring, take Benjamin. I'll make sure he comes back. And then he goes down to chapter 43. The famine was severe in the land. And when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, the father said, go again, buy us a little food. And Judah said, no, nah. the man's warned us, saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother's with you. If you send our brother with us, we'll go down buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face. In other words, they won't get any food unless your brother's with you. Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man you had another brother? Isaac, or Israel, remember, that's another name for Jacob. They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? And Judah said to his father, he said, you'll send the boy with me, and we'll make sure we get, you know, I bring him back. He said, if we had, verse 10, if we had not delayed, we'd, we could have returned twice. Then his father said to them, all right, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags. Carry a present down to the man. And describe some of the things there. Take double the money. Bring your money back. Take also your brother and arise. Go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may you send back your other brother and Benjamin. As for me, I, if I'm bereaved, my children, I'm bereaved. He's kind of resolved himself to that. All right, very interesting. Let's look at some of this. Now, first, if you look on your sheets, my first point, this is my father's world. You know, most of us will endure things, suffering for, we can endure quite a bit if we can retain some measure of control over it. What we don't like is when our lives become subject to somebody else's control. That we don't like. We don't like to submit. It's like one pastor was uh, preaching and, and he was sharing and he uh, uh, kept coughing. He was losing his voice. And so finally his wife in the audience went out, made some hot tea and brought it right up to the pulpit for him to drink. And the congregation, oh, oh you know, isn't that nice? And then he read the post-it note that was inside the cup and, and uh, she had written, please do not take this for submission. And uh, I'm not sure that's some issue they have going on, but it does take a lot of love and trust to be willing to s submit to one another. Uh, generally, our pride doesn't like to let us do that. And that's why sometimes then we find ourselves in situations that are beyond our control. Sometimes God will bring on uh, external pressures uh, into our lives to get us to realize, usually not until we're desperate, like uh, in Jacob's case too here, but to realize this is his world, not ours. Um, you know, we, um, we have to come to terms with him. Uh, we don't get to set the terms. We try to, we want to, to retain some control, but God always gets the last word. 
And that's what was happening here to Joseph's brothers. You know, they went to Egypt, got accused of being spies, got thrown into prison, they lost control. They were terrified. Finally, they were released, and as they're heading home, they found their bags of silver back in their bags on their animals, and when they saw that, they realized, what is God doing to us? They were terrified. Rather than seeing it as a token of God's grace and mercy to them, they were scared. And so they, again, they were forced to realize this is God's world, not theirs. Uh, God's in control, not them. And we need to remember the bigger picture here. God was rebuilding this family. Uh, God had big plans for this family. He was going to make a great nation of this family. But yet this family was pretty much kind of a poster family for dysfunction. And so God had to heal their brokenness before he could really make anything great out of them. So that's what he's doing here. In fact, we could raise this question, could it be that's what God's doing in your life? He has plans to bless you, to bless your family. But maybe there's issues there that need to be dealt with first. You know, have, have you maybe thought, thought of it in those terms? Something to think about. You know, basically there are three stages that God was working on. First, he was working in Joseph's life, 13 years as a slave and then as a prisoner and and uh, he responded well. He responded not in bitterness, but with faith. And, and God rewarded that. And God made him into a, a great man and a godly man. Joseph responded well. He's, he's you know, two thumbs up for Joseph. He, he did well through this. God was also working on Joseph's brothers. And that's kind of what we see in these verses, passages that we're dealing with last week and this week. We also had to work on Jacob, Jacob their father, again. And so now the brothers, uh, we look at the story, the brothers are back home. Uh, they've got food. You know, their stomachs are full. Uh, you know, they're kind of back in control again. Life is kind of somewhat back to normal. So no. Did they, uh, did they learn their lesson? Did they, did they acknowledge how God was at work in their lives? No. When we see them recounting this story, what happened to them, to their father, there's no mention of God. Did they now feel remorse for what they had done to Joseph? Joseph? Joseph who? There's no talk about Joseph. Or did they finally confess to their father what they had done, their terrible crime and sin? Not a bit. Uh, it's all back to uh, sin management. It's all back to spin control. Uh, it's back just to their old habits again. And you know, if, if you're... Com if you're not committed to just speaking the simple, honest truth, letting your yes be yes, your no be no, wherever it may lead, then you're always involved in some kind of spin control. Um, you know, just like what our media does, just like, you know, we see too often in, in politics. You know, spin the truth so it's to your advantage. That's what the world does. But that's not God's way. That's the opposite of God's way. And because it's not God's way, it's not wise, it's not honest, and it will come back to bite you sometimes. Because uh, this is God's world. He sets the terms. We don't get to. And uh, he always has the last word. So this is our Father's world. It has a lot of implications to that. Uh, second thing out there on the sheet point two is this disguising sin rather than confessing it. You know, back home, the brothers thought the way things were going were tolerable. God strongly disagreed. And uh, disguising the sin is not the same thing as confessing it and being forgiven. Uh, that's what the, disguising sin is what our culture does. That's what Joseph's brothers were doing. Confessing your sin, uh, coming clean is the wise thing to do. That's God's way. Well, Joseph's brothers were refusing to uh, do this, so God was going to have to kind of turn up the heat a little bit on them. Because uh, uh, remember, God has big plans for this family. And he's, 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 they weren't in any way ready for it yet. So God's trying to make them ready. Even Jacob, too, he didn't handle this well. Notice uh, verse 36, where he, he basically says, you know, you can sense the uh, self-pity that's there. Uh, the throne and all this, he basically says, everything's against me. I mean, almost makes you want to start playing the violin, you know, you know, and, 
it's like a little, reminds me of a little kid out in the playground. You know, nobody wants to play with them. And so they say, oh, you know, nobody wants to play with me. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Guess I'll eat some worms. Or, you know, you know that's kind of the, the idea you almost get. Or maybe they sing the song, uh, Jesus Loves Me, but with new words. I hope you've never sung this song. Like it says, no one loves me, this I know, my misfortune tells me so. So I sing this simple song, everything just turns out wrong. Nobody loves me, nobody loves me, nobody loves me, my bad luck tells me so. Hopefully you never sing that song. By the way, that was your special music for today. <laughs> so there it was. Don't ever say I never did special music. Next week, next week can be Eldon's turn. <laughs> but when we are, uh, you know, when we're in that state of mind, like uh, Jacob was, you know, that kind of self-pity, uh, you know, we just don't see things clearly. We don't see God clearly. We don't see our situations clearly. All we see is our bad luck. That's what Jacob was seeing. And I think, you know, he might even have forgotten God's promises to him. And that raises this question, too, you know, what... When we're in a tough situation and we're feeling anxious, fearful, whatever, what promises of God are we forgetting? And there's probably some promises we are forgetting. Well, in his self-pity, Jacob refused to let Benjamin go. Uh, he was trying to stay in control. Uh, but behind the scenes, again, we, we're starting to see a shift occur. And, and Jacob is losing power in the family and Joseph is gaining power in the family. So that's going on also. Jo Joseph's earlier dreams were coming true. All right, point three. Denying reality does not change it. You know, it's always interesting how uh, we imagine that things will change just by ignoring it. You know, that, uh, but yet we know denying reality will not change reality. Uh, if your car won't start today, it, you know, probably it's not going to start tomorrow either. Um, denial, you know, fixes nothing. So as God starts turning up the heat here on Jacob, uh, the food is running out. It said the food had basically had run out. And so, you know, they said, you know, they, they knew they were going to need more food. And they said, we can't go back unless Benjamin goes with us. So Jacob was refusing. He was refusing. Finally, the food has run out. The pressure is people are getting hungry. The livestock need grain. Finally, Jacob says, all right, all right already. You can take Benjamin. God had to turn the pressure up quite a bit on him before he was willing to do that. So, well, again, thinking of as he says, okay, you can take Benjamin. But it's interesting, even then he tries to influence the situation where it says he prepares some presents, he prepares, you know, take some of these best gifts. He's trying to, you know, influence this guy, uh, you know, by offering these kinds of uh, gifts. Finally, though, he sees, you know, there's nothing else he can do. Uh, you know, it's out of his control. Uh, you know, he's just going to, basically, he's putting Benjamin in God's hands. He's putting himself in God's hands, back into the, the Lord's hands, where they should have been all along anyway. Uh, but this raises a question, um, and that's this, why did Jacob hang on to Benjamin so hard? Why was he so adamant that the others could go, but not Benjamin. I think there's several reasons. One, one is a very natural reason. We, un we would understand this one. And that is Benjamin was the son of Rachel. Uh, Rachel was Jacob's true love. And uh, Rachel had two kids, Benny and Joseph. And uh, Joseph is now gone. And uh, Rachel died while giving birth to Ben. Benjamin. And so Benjamin was all that Jacob would have had left to remind himself of her. That's all he had left. So it would be very natural for him wanting to hang on to him. Uh, I think another reason why he wanted to hang on so much to uh, Benjamin was because he loved Rachel and not Leah, his other wife, and you can imagine the family dynamics that caused, uh, I think Jacob probably assumed, see, he knew of God's promise given to Abraham, his grandfather, and to his father Isaac, and to himself, that God would make a great nation out of him. 
I think Jacob assumed that God would fulfill that promise through one of Rachel's sons, that, you know, the wife he really loved, but Joseph was gone, and so all that was left was Benjamin, so it had to be Benjamin. Benjamin would be the one that God would use to make a great nation. Jacob assumed that God would use Benjamin. But Jacob thought he knew what God was going to do. But he was wrong. Often we get ourselves in spots like that too. We assume that God's going to, you know, if it's, why, you know, if the smart thing to do, this will happen. And we assume that. And we assume wrong. God often surprises us. He'll come up with a better way. Always in the long term. At least it's always better. So actually what Jacob thought was wrong. Uh, and it ends up the Lord used kind of a much lesser or, a, you know, kind of more of a middle brother, Judah, as the one from whom the Messiah and the Messianic line would continue. Jacob never would have guessed that one. Well, so I, again, I think he was trying to protect Benjamin because he thought this, surely it must be through Benjamin that this family will continue. He was wrong. And I think a third reason, this is kind of a guess, but I think there's some clues to kind of show it. But I'll just share it, and that's this. Uh, I think Jacob sensed that God was trying to get him alone again. And every time in the past when that happened, things didn't always go well for Jacob. Uh, remember there were times, uh, whenever he got in trouble, uh, he would, um, uh, whether he was running from his brother initially or, or um, you know, on the way and the vision he'd see of ladders and so on, and uh, every time it ended up kind of being a, a struggle and God won and Jacob lost. Uh, God triumphed, Jacob had to submit. And I think he sensed that God was up to something again and he didn't want to go through that again. He still wanted to hang on to Benjamin. And the clue is given in, in chapter 43, verse 14, it says, May God Almighty, uh, that's a name for God, uh, El Shaddai, God Almighty, it was a name of God that Jacob was familiar with, but as far as we know, this is the first time he ever used it. Uh, when God worked in his grandfather's life, Abraham, to make the covenant with Abraham, and when he renewed it with his father Isaac, he, God always used this name, El Shaddai, God Almighty. And so it was kind of like a divine signal that I think Jacob realized something big is up. This isn't just an ordinary situation. Something is, God's up to something, and so he uses this name, El Shaddai, uh, God Almighty. And so I think he was sensing God was trying to get him alone again. He wanted to, some things to do with him. And for example, when he was returning home after uh, and about to meet his brother Esau, remember that, hadn't seen him for 20 years, the brother he had tricked, wondering if his brother was still ticked, and he meets with God, and uh, he kind of wrestles with God, but through an angel, and the angel wins, event, you know, at the end, by putting Jacob's hip out of joint. And so the rest of Jacob's life, he walked with a very prominent limp. You know, if you were to see him, he'd be walking with a very, you know, a limp. So I, I think God was using these uh, uh, circumstances, in a sense, to uh, wrestle Jacob into submission again. Uh, I, I think Jacob was sensing that God was trying to get him alone to deal with this. Jacob was resisting because he knew that he, uh, to be alone with God was, would, be in, it would be in a wrestling match that he knew he could not win. And so he wanted to avoid that. He didn't want to let go of Benjamin. He could sense that's kind of what the problem was. And he didn't want to let him go. And I think he knew sometimes what we know too, that sometimes uh, to be alone with God might mean that God might bring up issues that we'd rather not deal with. And we become like Joseph's brothers. We just try to ignore it, we want to deny it, we hide it, we put on spin control, whatever we can do. We don't want to deal with it. And we sense sometimes that God brings those up and he wants us to deal with it. He loves us too much to leave us the way we are. And, and sooner or later, he will put us in situations to bring that up. He will use various circumstances to turn up the heat, so to speak, 
uh, to get us to face up to some of these things, just like he had to do with Jacob here in this case. Jacob refused to let Benjamin go until they got really hungry. And then, all right, okay, you can take them. And, uh, and I think, you know, the sooner it is for us to, to surrender our lives completely to the Lord's loving and gracious control, the better it will be for us. It means no bargainer's prayer, making that, I'll do this if you do that. It's just the sinner's prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner, from Luke 18. And you know what the really neat thing is, too, about all this? Is that when God gets us alone and he gets our attention, uh, not only does he want us to face things that are hindering us, but then when we do and we relinquish control to him, it's his world, he sets the terms, then he also blesses us with his joy, with his supernatural peace, with hope, with confidence. All these other things get thrown in with that. You know, because see, when Jacob finally gave up control here of Benjamin, basically putting Benjamin in God's hands, he's all right, if I'm bereaved of all my kids, then I'm bereaved. And he kind of just, the resignation there, he's given up. But when he finally did that, although he could not see it at the time, just like we often can't see it at the time, he was walking right into God's blessings. It's like God was saying, I've been, I've been waiting for you to relinquish your control over Benjamin. And, and, and Jacob said, no, not Benjamin. And God says, yes, I want him. And Jacob said, no, not him. But when he finally did, he had to be kind of desperate for he did, but he finally did. He was walking right into God's blessings because we see not only did he get, end up getting Benjamin back, but he got Simeon back. He even got Joseph back. What a deal. He didn't know that. Plus, he got to live in a place where he could dwell securely, safely, and with plenty of food. What a deal he got. He didn't see it at first, so it took faith. But that's what he was resisting all the time. Because I want to bless you, but you're, you're refusing to let me. And, and often, again, he's trying to get Jacob alone so he can deal with these things. No because I don't want to deal with these things. I kind of know what you might ask me to do, and I don't want to do it. So God turns up the heat. He's got a thousand and one ways he can do that. That's kind of what we see going on here. Again, so if all you do is make bargains with God, trying to set the terms, uh, you'll never experience the many blessings that he has for those who just give that complete surrender uh, of our lives to God. Uh, and of what that kind of surrender can bring. Let God set your agenda. Let God set the terms. He, let him lead. So, some final questions uh, to close here. Are there places in your life where God seems to be turning up the heat? You know, is there something he's trying to get your attention on? You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to ignore it for as long as you possibly can? Um... Maybe hopefully he'll just die first before you have to deal with it. You know, and then let the kids deal with it. Every once in a while I hear that, uh, not so much with so much dealing with sin, but uh, parents, uh, wasn't that long ago I heard of a parents, they said, you know, their, their lives basically were a mess, their finances were a mess, their house was a mess, and they said, you know what, I'm not going to deal with this, I'm just going to die and let my kids deal with it. And I thought, Oh, unloving. Please don't do that. Uh, you at least have some idea where your finances are. Your kids are going to have no idea. You do with it. Don't ignore it. But anyway, we can do that too with issues, moral issues as well. God had to bring a lot of pressure into Jacob's life before he was willing to change. So what will it take for you and me? Our second question, what is your Benjamin? You know, Benjamin is the son that, God, that Jacob was refusing to deal with, to part with. He was assuming certain things about Benjamin, and he was assuming wrong. Uh, you know, others, interesting, uh, I wonder how the brothers felt. You know, your other brothers, you can go, not Benjamin. I couldn't stand it if I lost him, too. What is your Benjamin? It's kind of like when Abraham, remember he had to offer up his, you know, his son Isaac. And then he didn't have to. God stopped him just in time, but God was testing his faith to see if he was willing to. 
Or if you want a more uh, modern example, think of, if you're familiar with the movies, The Lord of the Rings. Remember, it was that ring, that one ring that was uh, most precious to a character in their name, Gollum. That's what he called it, most precious, my precious. What is most precious to you? What is your Benjamin? It could be a lot of things. You know, something that we're getting a false sense of security from. Because if it's not from the Lord, it really is a false sense of security because anything else can be taken from us. Is it a, is it a, uh, is it a child? that you refuse to let go into God's hands? Is it a job that you refuse to let go of? Is it a, a, a skill you have? Uh, is it your looks? Um, is it a spouse? Is it your money? What is it? What's, what's your Benjamin, perhaps? You know, how tightly are you hanging on to it and refusing to trust God with it? And then the third question, when was the last time God really had you alone? Just you and him, working things out, uh, when you know who's going to win. So, but in that sweet surrender comes blessings we never dreamed of before. Because remember, when God wins, as Christians, we win too. Well, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this uh, story of Joseph and Jacob and his family and how you're at work in their lives. And, and it brings up things how you are still at work in people's lives today. And you want to bless us and bless our families. And, and sometimes there may be issues that, that maybe we don't want to deal with. Maybe some sin that we don't want to let go of because secretly we just rather enjoy it. Lord, you love us too much to let that continue for too long, and you have ways of turning up the heat to get our attention. And sadly, too often, we wait till we get in a very desperate situation before we're willing to change. Lord, help us be willing to change quickly, to trust you, to take all the things that we have, whether it's our kids, money, whatever, uh, and to entrust them into your loving hand. I mean, that's the safest place for them. That's real security. So, Lord, again, in this new week, help us to walk with you. Help us to trust you. Uh, and help us, our, our lives to, and our relationship with you, be one of great openness and transparency and joy and trust, having that kind of childlike faith and trust and simplicity to just walk with you, knowing that uh, you're able to set the, the terms and the agenda. And those, that's fantastic. That's the way we want it. Help us to live that way. So thank you for this week. Thank you for this great time of year, this Thanksgiving season, for all the things that we're thankful for. Lord, help us to look again for those things and to truly be thankful. Of course, in your name we pray.